Sure. Good day to everyone. Salamat siyang. Magandang araw. I hope you are doing well to our panelists, to our guests, participants, and friends. Welcome to our day one plenary lectures for the Conference of the International Council for Historical and Cult Cultural Cooperation Southeast Asia and the 2020 Philippine Historical Association Annual Conference with the team Arrivals, Conflict and Transformation. I am Wensley Reyes of the Philippine Normal University and the Philippine Historical Association. I will serve as your moderator for the plenary lectures of our partners from Malaysia and Indonesia. Before we start with the lectures, we wish to inform our friends and participants that you could interact with our speakers and ask questions later during the open forum. Just press the raise hand button and wait to be recognized. You may also type your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box. We will try to accommodate as much questions as possible. For our 1.30 to 2.30 session, we will have one paper to be presented. So allow me to introduce our speaker. Our presenter is a professor at the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization, ISTAP, from the International Islamic University, Malaysia. He is a visiting professor at the Center for Policy Research and International Studies, University Science Malaysia. He is also a senior fellow of the De La Salle University Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub. He also led a project in transliterating from Jawi to Romanized Malay script, a total of 1,200 letters from the Light Letters Collection and is recently and has recently acquired the rights to the digitalized images of the letters from the London University School of Oriental and African Studies. The images are now reposited at the library in University Sans Malaysia. To present his paper entitled The Light, paper, the Light Letters, 1771 to 1794, Reconstruct, Reconstructing Southeast Asia as Global History, and representing Persatuan Sejara Malaysia, let us welcome Dato Dr. Ahmad Murad American. Thank you. Uh, salam sejahtera to, to all who are attending this uh, session. First of all, thank you uh, to the organizers for uh, allowing me to uh, present uh, in this conference. Uh, you've done quite well uh, in, in, in many ways in bringing uh, South Asian scholars together and to speak about Southeast Asia, which I think uh, is uh, critical uh, over, over recent years. Uh, my, my talk uh, is uh, on the light letters. Um, before that, uh, I, I would like to mention that uh, the sentiment this morning from the keynote, and, and Farish has said it all uh, on, on the South Asia's global history, and the two other uh, uh, plenary speakers, all uh, uh, advocate for uh, recasting Southeast Asia uh, within the context of global history. And, and, and this is, uh, uh, I would say, a milestone in, in, the, in the collective effort uh, to uh, relook into certain periods and uh, 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 re-narrate uh, perspectives on events and uh, interactions and connections in South Asia. I, uh, uh, last year, uh, I presented a, uh, a paper on the Magellan and Panglima Awang uh, in light of Malacca. I realized that that part, that portion, uh, over, over 100 plus years, uh, would be essential to look at as global history, uh, especially with regard to Malacca. Uh, so far, I have not seen works on Malacca written from that perspective. Uh, Malacca has been uh, you know, uh, looked at as, as a cosmopolitan place, uh, a place of, uh, uh, of meeting uh, of, of cultures and, and uh, uh, peoples. And of course, uh, as an entrepot, 84 languages are spoken. 
uh, at that time uh, uh, in the 1400, Europe was in the Dark Ages. Uh, so we looking at Malacca in, 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 in that manner, uh, in, in the manner of another enlightenment uh, would, would set Malacca uh, and the region as, 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 uh, uh, as a competitor uh, to European history. As such, uh, you know, it's important to, I hope that the Malaysian historians are, are listening uh, to globalize the history of Malacca uh, as well as the region. I'm not a historian by profession. I, uh, I dabble into history. I look at history as a weapon. Uh, I, uh, I'm involved in history uh, with regard to uh, the study of uh, Penang. Uh, it's uh, the representation of Penang history, uh, which has been problematic and uh, which has been uh, over the last more than 200 years seen to be uh, 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 an island that has been uh, illegitimately uh, possessed uh, by, by, by the Europeans. Uh, that led me to uh, the light letters. Uh, it, was, it was by accident in the sense that uh, about 10 years back, I was uh, asking for some grants and uh, uh, two decades ago, I knew of uh, the light letters. I was told that the light letters are in, in, in the, uh, the, the School of Oriental and African Studies in the archives. And uh, <clears throat> people have been telling me that there's nothing to the light letters except for uh, trade uh, receipts, uh, you know, uh, commercial transactions. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the things which I want to do, I wanted to do in my grant at the time was to look into the existence of the, the Malays uh, on the island of Penang, because uh, the historiography says that uh, the island was deserted. Uh, it was a terra nullius, and, and, and therefore, you know, it justifies uh, the possession of uh, Penang by Francis Light. Uh, but what I got in terms of sources, oral sources uh, and uh, other artifacts says that uh, there are people on the island uh, at one time, uh, 10,000, sometimes 5,000, but recorded in some sources as uh, 50 or 100. Uh, but nevertheless, the, uh, the uh, uh, British courts uh, in, in Penang between uh, uh, 1807 to 1840s uh, all uh, deny the existence of uh, uh, a settlement or society on the island. The judges themselves lied. Actually, it was it was uh, you know it was incestuous for the judges to lie in the own court. So uh, this led me to the letters. I, I contacted uh, SOS and uh, they asked me what can be done. Uh, I proposed to them, but it took me eight years uh, to get the rights to the images of the letters. Meanwhile, they've given me the images. But uh, before that, uh, you know, be, be, until, until now, until 2018-19, uh, uh, many historians uh, have found it difficult to get access to the letters. Uh, they'll go to the SOAS archives and they'll be given uh, uh, one volume at a time. and. Uh, there's no assistance apart from that. Uh, but I got everything. When I went there, I got all 11 volumes. Uh, and uh, I got a, a digitized version for free of charge from Celeste. And uh, finally, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I gave the, uh, the uh, uh, digitized versions to the library at University of Science Malaysia, where I was from. Uh, an agreement of sign, and now it's accessible. Now, what, what is the light letters? Uh, now, essentially, while, while uh, working on the light letters, I was looking into just a small portion uh, uh, on, on some evidence of uh, the existence of the Malays in, in Penang before 1786. Yes, there were some uh, letters describing uh, uh, Malay populations uh, in Tanjung, in, in Georgetown, uh, that was, uh, the year would be 1786-87. I could not find the uh, existence of the Malays in Penang before 1786. That 
that mythical year or that year that is, uh, is deceptive uh, to the world. Uh, uh, what I discovered is that uh, the lead letters uh, provide a window uh, to South Asia. Uh, there are many ways that we can look at lead letters. But before that, uh, uh, you know, the lead letters is a collection of uh, 1,200 letters, probably the largest collection of uh, million letters in the world, uh, perhaps larger than the uh, Raffles collection. Uh, it was uh, uh, reposited first, first in, in, in the uh, King's College, uh, 1835, then given to uh, uh, SOAS in 1916 when SOAS was established. Uh, now these letters actually would have been lost. Uh, well, nobody knows where it was had it not been for, for William Marsden. You know William Marsden is a scholar of, of Sumatra. Uh, Marsden has written a, a number of other works. Uh, he's a student of, 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 of Malay language. Uh, Marsden bought it at an auction in London. And when he died, uh, his widow bequeathed it to King's College. And then it was uh, after that uh, uh, given to uh, SOAS. In SOAS, uh, it was there hibernating for 200 years, uh, I suppose. Uh, uh, and, and not much has been done. Uh, in, in, in the years that I was trying to get access to it and uh, digitize it, there was a lot of politics. I think Farish would know. <laughs> in, in, in SOAS, I was, I was prevented. Actually, I was literally prevented from studying the letters. Um, and uh, but I said, uh, I have to go on. Uh, I've got some grants. So uh, no, uh, and, and I want to, to know what, what the letters contain. I want to go against the sentiment that it's only uh, letters of uh, commerce. Uh, the lead letters are letters uh, written uh, by, uh, it was early on uh, under the Marsden collection. Yeah. Marsden, William Marsden kept the letters, but it was labels like letters. Um, the uh, Identified as manuscript uh, MS40320, 40320, 1200 uh, letters bound in 11 volumes. Uh, and then there will be about 2400 plus images on both sides. Uh, these letters are written, uh, well, in the collection. Uh, when you say let letters, not all letters are. Are written to Francis Light. Uh, many letters are written by uh, the Malay sultans, uh, by Malay dictatories, by uh, even the common people. Uh, in fact, also by Malay women uh, who uh, perhaps uh, who, who if you read the letters, they, they would have some commercial links. Uh, with light. Some say that there could also be some romantic uh, uh, nuances uh, to the letters uh, uh, looking to the, uh, the, 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 uh, the personality of light. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they are written by the kings, uh, by the sultans, uh, by uh, the uh, Saudaga Raja, the crown agents, uh, by, by women and, and by, by traders. Uh, and, and, and by other degree tricks, uh, the Pangyan or the An -An Raja, the princess, uh, the prince, uh, to Francis Light. There are also letters uh, 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 written to William Marston and uh, also to his brother. Uh, now, what, what this shows essentially is. is apart from looking at it as a, a window of 23 years, fairly 23 years, it also tells us that the native, quote unquote, speaks. The native is not a silent uh, uh, object. The native expresses. And one moving letter was, uh, there were 
about four letters, was by a lady who uh, was married to uh, Masden's brother in Bengkulu, Bengkulu. And uh, they had uh, three daughters. This was around uh, 17, uh, 1770s. Some letters uh, would have uh, the year, uh, some have no year. And, uh, and, and Masden, uh, the younger Masden, uh, wanted to leave this lady together with the daughters. Uh, this lady was called Chetlina. At that time, for those uh, uh, interested in gender studies or empowering women, they would be very interested. They would be, you know, they would see that, they, that, that, that this Malay woman uh, can write, uh, have written, and very expressive and very strong in the personality. And it was a very emotional letter well written, well expressed, wanting back her daughter, persuading Master not to take the daughter back to England. I, I was moved to tears actually when, when I was reading <laughs> I was reading the letters. So you see, the, 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 the emotional moments and, and this uh, essentially uh, is what the letter is all about. The, the, the emotions, the expressions from uh, what would have been conceived as a silent native. Uh, go back to Edward Said's, uh, you know, that the native doesn't speak uh, in terms of the, the assumptions of originalism, but this, here the native speaks. Uh, uh, ladies speak, uh, the uh, town agents speak. Uh, there was resistance uh, in many ways. There was concern of, uh, of uh, not only uh, uh, the British, but also of the other uh, European powers, as mentioned by by, by Farish this morning, uh, some of the selectors uh, uh, would be uh, would, would mention the, the threat by by or, or the visit by uh, uh, French ships uh, to Kuala uh, uh Some would refer to the Danes. The Danes were also here <laughs> in, in in South Asia. Uh, some there's one letter. Uh, asking uh, friends like for help uh, because the Dutch has exiled uh, uh, four Ulu Balangs from, from Pangaruyum. And uh, the letter offered, yeah, the Dutch can have gold and whatever, but give us back our Ulu Balang. So, so again, these are letters expressive of the period uh, looking into uh, you know, uh, problems and, 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 and incidences. Uh, <clears throat> Now I, I like to go back to uh, to uh, uh, the the metadata on the letters. Master, you know, this is from uh, notes of Master in 1827 uh, to, to 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 give us a, a better picture of uh, the the original condition, uh, the original contents of the letters. Uh, early on, uh, the letters were in bundles, like files uh, bundled up, but it was bound. Uh, I think about maybe 40, 50 years ago uh, by uh, some scholars, I think Russell Jones and Eurip Kratz. Um, one of them prohibited me from studying the letters. Uh, I, th I thought perhaps they do not want the letters to reveal too much about colonialism or about, about themselves. Uh, this is what uh, Master Note says uh, <clears throat> in 1827. Malay correspondence uh, consisting chiefly of letters from the Rajas and principal native merchants of the peninsula and neighboring uh, islands, addressed to Captain Francis Light and Captain James Scott of Pulau Pinang in several portfolios. Uh, this is from the Bibliotheca Masdenia Philologica et Orientalis, a catalog of books and manuscripts collected with a view to the general comparison of languages and of the study of oriental literature. This is uh, uh, from Marston. Now, the, the, uh, who, who is Francis Light? Francis Light was a country trader. Uh, and Scott was his business partner. And in, in, in many ways, uh, there was commercial interest. There was, there was interest uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to benefit uh, uh, from their linkages with uh, with the Malay archipelago. And then uh, another description 
uh, from Rick Reeves, uh, Rick Reeves uh, Warhawi and uh, Gallup, uh, Indonesian manuscripts in Great Britain, uh, MS40320, a collection of several hundred Malay letters in 11 bundles, consisting primarily of correspondence, correspondences received with some copies of letters sent by Captain Francis Light and Captain James Scott of Penang, and to rulers and dignitaries of Malay Sultanates in AD 1780s and 1790s. But there are also items from Aceh, Jambi, Indragiri, Minangkabau, Palembang, Pedir, Siak, and other places in Sumatra, from Brunei and Sambas, and from Tidore. So you see that these letters, uh, they don't, they are not only from, from uh, uh, the Malay Peninsula, but also uh, from a large part of the Malay archipelago. Uh, early on, uh, one of the problems which I face in, in, in getting rights, uh, because getting those rights are important, uh, because that will be the first time that the letters are available uh, publicly. Uh, it was the issue of copyrights. Uh, there was a lot of complexity in terms of using uh, the UN copyright laws, using uh, America's uh, copyright uh, and, and Britain's uh, copyright laws. And, uh, uh, and also they've asked me to get uh, permission from the descendants of the letter writers. There will be a few hundred. They also have asked me to get permission from uh, descendants of Francis Wright, which I managed to meet uh, uh, in, in Adelaide uh, some years back. And I told him that uh, of this, uh, this uh, intention of mine. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, uh, so as, said that uh, the letters are written from your world. In other words, from, from South Asia, from the world where, where we, we live. Therefore, uh, they waived the copyright and uh, they uh, agreed to, to give the copies. So, uh, and uh, as I've said, uh, Muslim, uh, uh body in auction. Mas Masden left the Malay Archipelago in 1779. But Masden would have known uh, light. Uh, he was not just a scholar. He, he has these, these people of context. And uh, 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 light uh, was in the region since uh, 1770 or 1771. Uh, he left Britain uh, and he was in the Malay Archipelago for roughly 23 years. He died in uh, 1794. And uh, he was initially based in Phuket, Ujong Salam. But he has traveled all over. Well, he has been to Aceh, he has traveled to Riau, uh, to, to Riau and he went to Bangkulen. And that's when he met uh, Marsden. And apparently they had some uh, business dealings, uh, and that's why uh, I think uh, after that, Masden left uh, uh, into to England and, and uh, was involved in, in some dealings that uh, that was started by Light. Also, uh, the contact uh, of Masden with with the letters uh, would be through uh, Light's eldest son William, who later came to uh, uh, to to uh, be regarded as the uh, founder of Adelaide. He laid the grid in Adelaide. His, uh, his letters, uh, William's letters, William was a military, uh, in the military, he had seen action in, 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 the, in Europe. I think he was involved in some of the wars that Faris mentioned. Uh, and uh, he, he was in Egypt. And uh, I've, I've read his, uh, his letters in the Adelaide uh, municipal archives. Uh, he has uh, also some letters from, from Egypt, uh, it was Ottoman. I couldn't read. Uh, you know, uh, I, I tried to get some people to read, but it was uh, from the Pasha in, in, in Cairo. Uh, so William was born uh, in Kuala Kedah and uh, I don't know, would have, uh, 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 Master would have met him. Uh, and so, so, so I'm trying to establish the link. And, and uh, the size and condition of letters, it varies. Uh, the width would be from 20.1 cm to 22.2 cm. Uh, 
uh, that's the width of the lattice. The length will be from 27.1 cm to 57.1 cm. I measured. Uh, I had a team to measure when to show us. It took uh, several weeks to measure those letters, and some are very lengthy. Uh, generally well preserved, uh, with some jagged edges uh, of the letters. Now, from the letters, uh, we have classified. Uh, we can classify those letters into, into several uh, uh, letters. One is letters sent to uh, Francis Light by, by the natives. Uh, and this would be uh, the Pangeran from Palembang, uh, the young one from Minangkabau, uh, from uh, the, uh, the Sultan from Sambas, the Pangeran from Johor, there was a Pangeran in Johor, uh, and the Sultans of the Blue States, except for Perlis, that has, uh, is not around yet, <laughs> uh, but almost all Sultan, Kedah, Perak, Selangor, uh, Tunganu, and the Kelantan. So letters sent to light. Huh? Uh, and then letters sent to Scott, Light's business partner. Uh, well, uh, Scott is uh, Light's uh, business sidekick. You can imagine how they have benefited uh, monetarily uh, from, from, if you look at the history of uh, Pulau Pinang, you'll find that uh, uh, much uh, after, well, after Light's death, uh, his, his uh, property was squandered by Scott. Scott, uh, Prevented Light's uh, widow to to have uh, uh, to have uh, the property, uh, and uh, notes, jottings, drafts of letters and copies sent by uh, by Light. Uh, sometimes uh, you know receipts of uh, how many chickens and how many eggs that were bought by the uh, by the Nakoda by the uh, by the uh, Nakoda Raja uh, or, or Sadaga Raja, we call it uh, the, the crown agent. Uh, there are many crown agents. This is another story by itself. Uh, letters from Malay monarchs and aristocracy and other bills, other documents, bills, petitions, uh, contracts. We also have uh, seen some uh, letters pertaining to uh, the list of uh, chiefs in, in Pada. <laughs> they, they, they sent it to, I think, Marcel must have gotten it. Yeah? Uh, and also uh, uh, Salasila, uh, genealogy of some of the uh, population in Sumatra. Uh, specifically, the letters are from the monarchs and state entities. State-wise, uh, and, uh, now, when, when we look at the states, the states are not like what they are now. You know? uh, the borders are, well, they're different. And borders move uh, forever. Borders will, will change. But uh, at any time, uh, the Kedah border was different. Uh, Selangor, uh, uh, from Perak, from Penganu Kelantan, royal agents, and uh, Places like Aceh Asahan and Batubara. Uh, Batubara and Asahan were important ports uh, at that time, which has, which has been underrated actually in, 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 in many discourses. Sia, of course, uh, 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 a Malay center of power, Palembang and, and, and Borneo. Uh, from those letters, uh, I always like to broach on, on, on what can be done. I always joke that uh, we can do 100 PhD theses from the letters. Uh, see, from those letters, uh, my initial interest, again, I said was Penang, but second also was to look into Malay interactions with Europe, uh, which is a work in progress. Uh, but other things we can find, uh, uh, economic systems in the Malay archipelago before the 1800s, before the establishment of uh, European institutions, especially in the 1770s, uh, the nature of uh, uh, trade, uh, the nature of uh, goods. And one can find that uh, 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 in, 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 in the letters, uh, uh, words like uh, tin, pepper, gold, rotten are, are many. Uh, they are mentioned in many letters, even elephants. Uh, and uh, uh, some letters uh, mention the export of elephants to India and Sri Lanka uh, from Pedah. It will be from Palakada or also perhaps from uh, Saturn. Uh, systems of writing. Uh, so far, uh, those who have written about the letters would be those from philology or from, from literature. Uh, so systems of writing. And business and commercial trans, uh, relations, uh, diplomacy and foreign relations, 
uh, especially so uh, in relation to the acquisition of uh, the island of Qatar. Uh, very interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm working on the on the letters to get it published to uh, to say that there is no uh, treaty of 1786. Uh, there was a 1791 treaty and 1800, but no 1786 treaty, which has been uh, bended around the world, which has been uh, established in history, uh, both text, I mean, uh, you know, the, the visuals also, the visual that uh, uh, light uh, hoisted the Union Jack uh, on 11 August of 1786, uh, with a caption that uh, the Sultan of Qadda uh, agreed and gave the island to friends like it, it, it's a fast, it's a destruction. Uh, uh, we have found the letters saying that the Sultan never agreed. In fact, the Sultan resisted uh, uh, the, the, the giving of uh, the island uh, to Francis Light. Uh, Malay cosmology and worldview, uh, worldview and cosmology in the Malay world with regard to uh, uh, time and we got to a number of years, you know, the, 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 the system of uh, telling the year and life in the archipelago before colonialism and imperialism. Uh, one can also look into the formation of polities and states uh, in the Malay Peninsula and, 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 the, and the Malay archipelago, social and political life, uh, activities of Malay women, which I've mentioned. I mean, they are quite a substantial number of letters. Kedah and Global History, which is also another one, which uh, if you look at Kedah, uh, that window will be uh, in the modern period. But if you look at before that, uh, Kedah has been in Global History for, for a long time. And uh, one of the things mentioned in, in, in one of the letters is the uh, port of Kuala Kedah, at that time called Kuala Bahang. Uh, it seems that uh, in trying to acquire Georgetown or the island, Francis Light had attempts to destroy Kuala Kedah because uh, he did not want Kuala Kedah to compete with, with Georgetown. So this is again another scheme that we found from, from Light. Uh, apart from that also, uh, 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 with regard to Francis Light. I don't want to center Francis Light, but I have to mention about him. Uh, uh, things like uh, uh, trading of opium uh, to, to the Malay Archipelago, uh, in the Malay Archipelago, uh, supplying of arms and uh, supplying of slaves. Uh, in the letter, it states, Buddha Beta. Uh, Buddha, Buddha Kita, my, my boys, these are, these are slaves. And, and it, it's part of life. Uh, slaves escaping from Palembang to Pulau Pinang, uh, slaves, uh, you know, uh, and everywhere. Uh, people in debt uh, out there. Uh, cosmopolitanism in, in, in the Malay Archipelago and Western, Malay Western connections and, and interactions. Um, Now, uh, there are also, uh, you, you go through the series of words. Uh, I've uh, developed a glossary, and I find that uh, there are many, many words which, are, which, uh, which reflect uh, the thinking and the sentiment at the time. For example, uh, the word mata mata. This is uh, 1770s, uh, refers to the police. So uh, again, uh, uh, Mata Mata is there, the police, uh, senor, uh, uh, Portuguese, uh, uh, meaning Mr. or Mrs. Uh, also uh, Spanish dollar, uh, all the trading was done. Spanish dollar was uh, the equivalent to the US dollar uh, now. Uh, words like governador, uh, referring to governor. These, these were words that were used. Um, <clears throat> Now uh, coming back to uh, to to uh, uh, the letters uh, before I end, uh, I like to highlight the focus on the letters between Light and the Sultans of Kedah. Uh, there are about 
140 letters. Uh, and uh, this has uh, this, uh, this concern uh, four parties. One is Kedah, the other Siam, the other Burma, which brings the, the Europeans into the picture. So again, you, you see uh, 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 Kedah as the center of, of, of these letters and how the balancing of the Kedah Sultans uh, and 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 the, the the protection that the Kedah Sultan wants uh, from the Siamese, also from the Burmese, because the Burmese in their war with Siam, they would send a letter to the Sultan asking for men, asking for eggs, asking for chicken, asking for prau boats, <laughs> and uh, the Sultan, uh, you know, this took place over a number of years, uh, from 1771 to 1774, and the two Sultans, Sultan. Uh, Zanul Azil Muhammad Jiwa Shah and Sultan Abdullah Makaram Shah, the son uh, of Sultan Zanul Azilin. Uh, during the Sultan Zanul Azilin's time, uh, there was also uh, uh, the earlier uh, asking for Kuala Pinang, but uh, he refused. And finally, uh, Light uh, went to the, the son. Essentially, uh, the Sultan Pindah wanted protection from war. So the Sultan was using his diplomacy. Uh, from 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 uh, from Siam. Uh, uh, so what we can find is that uh, one of the things that I would like to 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 uh, to relate is the Malay idiom of Baga uh, Belanda minta tanah. Uh, how the, the the Dutch asked for land. There, there's a lot of stories. There, there's a whole folklore of that. But uh, where, where this is concerned, the earlier uh, agreement was uh, the strip of land which is now Georgetown. The strip of land in, in, in the, uh, the, the, the Fort Cornwallis, that's all. And the Sultan was, was uh, discussing. But finally, uh, Light took the whole island without the Sultan's agreement. And uh, uh, the letters uh, indicate several rounds of discussion and several terms of agreement. And finally, the Sultan did not agree on two terms. Before it was concluded, the island was, the island was lost. So, uh, so from these letters, uh, as a conclusion, we can, we can see that it, it, it can become a major source uh, for uh, the, the dynamics of uh, uh, Malay European or Malay archipelago uh, European relations. And uh, as such, uh, uh, it'd, be, it'd be timely to look at uh, the histories and, and, and the incidents in, 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 in the Malay archipelago as essential and integral to uh, global history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Murad, for that very interesting discussion on the light letters. So uh, before we proceed with the open forum, we would like to thank you for your efforts in acquiring the rights for these historical sources that will be very valuable for future research of our young and seasoned Southeast Asian scholars. We would like to thank our gratitude yeah. for doing that. Well, you are welcome to the uh, Library at UC Science Malaysia. And you can get uh, the images of the letters and the metadata. Also, I forgot to mention that uh, uh, we have transliterated uh, the letters from Jawi to Rumi, Romanized. So it's easier to read. Uh, the earlier project was also to translate the letters into English, but uh, we thought that we would distort the meaning, but they will be translated on a case by case basis. So, uh, you have a, a compendium of, 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 of uh, different versions of the letter. But one thing also, it's the, the, I, see, the letters, uh, it's difficult to say how many, because the letters are written without a period, without a full stop. The sentences are continuous. <laughs> and uh, 
the, the message may be one, but the meaning, uh, the, the letter may be one whole page or two pages. But the message is only, yeah, please get, uh, please get light to help us to, to recover our, uh, the debts. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Sir, at this point, we are now opening the floor for some queries. So to begin with, allow me to read some of the comments and questions. So from Dr. Farish Noor, uh, the marginalization of Kuala Keda by the East India Company was similar to the, how the rise of Batavia under Dutch rule contributed to the decline of Banten that was its rival. Uh, for some questions uh, we have here, are there documents that mention the Philippines, uh, Filipinos or Spanish colonies? <laughs> Uh, so far as I've noticed, uh, no. Uh, the letters have not mentioned uh, uh, Filipinos or, or, or Manila men. Uh, but I've read some documents uh, mentioning uh, Manila men, meaning people from the, from the Philippine Islands uh, coming to Penang uh, in, in, in 17, uh, uh, 1790s. Uh, but uh, from the letters so far, are these, these, these letters uh, you cannot read in one, one, one go. So far, I've not noticed uh, any any reference to the Philippine Islands. But to Brunei, yes. Brunei, Sambas, Borneo, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, another comment here. Uh, we appreciate the use of letters as historical sources. Letters are often lost or neglected and usually not preserved. <laughs> But letters are personal. It shows the personal side of the writer and the receiver. So the question is, how should we treat letters in general as a historical source? Yes. Yeah. The, uh, the letters are uh, we yeah, the letters the are written. Letters as historic. That, that's okay. The, the, the letters are they are, they, are, they are written at that time. At that time, uh, they would know that it will be, be a public document. Uh, I think we, we have to read the letters as, as they are with regard, within the larger context of, uh, of uh, 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 the region uh, and, and, and uh, what is known as, as, as the history of uh, relationship uh, uh, and the coming of colonialism uh, in, 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 in the Malay archipelago. They are, in a sense, yes, uh, because, but each letter has a seal. So uh, uh, this seal uh, is a symbol of uh, authority, uh, in a sense that they are, they are private public. Uh, even Francis Light has a seal. Uh, it's not normal for uh, a, a non-native to have, to have a seal, but Francis Light has a red seal. And, and, and most letters uh, in Kedah, they have red seal. Uh, uh, Annabelle T. Gallup, no, but this will be inclusive from time. The other letters will be uh, uh, sealed in, in black. But light, uh, as, as you know, you see, when, when you read all the letters, all uh, those who have written to Francis Light uh, know him personally. There, there is an intimate relations, actually between light and those letter writers. Uh, you can imagine uh, somebody who has left his homeland uh, and, and, and is in this cultural region for 23 years. Light essentially is, is a Malay. He's a native. Culturally, you see, uh, he, he reads Jawi. He speaks Malay. He knows uh, the ways of, of the local people. And uh, the letters address uh, light as as kekasih uh, beta, which means translate into uh, uh, my lover, kekasih uh, uh, beta, and uh, the titles of Dewa Raja, but that's the title given uh, by, by 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 the King of Siam, or some say it's by the Sultan of Kedah. But there is this intimate relations, uh, especially between the letters between. Francis Light and the Sultans of Kedah, both. Uh, also with the other, uh, other. one is that uh, the style of writing those letters, uh, you know, Sehingga Bulan dan Bintang, Surat Tulus Ikhlas, Letters of Sincerity, Kepada Kekasih, Kekanda Beta. But also uh, 
uh, a particular mention where letters between Francis Light and the Sultan is Anna Anda Beta, my son. So what, what could that mean? So again, uh, yeah, it's very personal. And the Sultan looks at Francis Light as a son or as a son-in-law. The story goes that Light, uh, uh, Light has married uh, uh, a lady from the Kendah Palace. Uh, this cannot be confirmed, uh, but I'm making my own investigation, <laughs> and uh, it will surprise many. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. essentially, yeah, I, it was written many times uh, in, in, in several several uh, discourses, uh, uh, notes, uh, uh, biography, uh, letters uh, of the, the 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 light as uh, was the the son-in-law of the sultan. Sultan, the first Sultan, Sultan Zalam Azil Muhammad Jiwasha. Also, like uh, in his dealings with with the, with the natives uh, in the Malay Archipelago, he he wore he he did not wear the Georgian uh, costume you know, with the hat and the red coat. No, he wore the sarong and the kain pelikan and the songkok. That was his uh, and Scott. That was their daily. Uh, dressing. Uh, this was not written in Malaysia, but was written uh, in the source in Phuket. On Phuket history, they have mentioned that. Uh, uh, and you can imagine if a person has been cut off from, from their motherland for 20 years, they will be part of it. They'll, they'll, they'll be part of the Malay world. Culturally, uh, uh, you know, uh, Light and the, the others would have uh, 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 South uh, Malay Archipelago DNA. So again, uh, I think one has to see that uh, uh, in, in that sense. Uh, personal, yes, but uh, public uh, and other Thank you, sir. That's uh, well noted, sir. Sir, uh, I think uh, Dr. Farish Noor would like to give his question. Uh... Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, hi again, uh, Murad. Um, I have a question about, you know, the, the, the secrecy behind these letters, right? I mean, you alluded to that earlier. And, and uh, you know, there has, and, and many of us who go around looking for this sort of stuff, you know, often we encounter resistance because there are certain stories that people don't want to be told. Um, now, when it comes to light, of course, you know, I, I agree that light was very much embedded in the regional, local geopolitics of, of that part of the Malay world. But at the same time, as you know, uh, you know, he was cutting deals on both sides. So on the one hand, you know, offering uh, without authorization, you know, uh, protection to Kadah. But at the same time, also supplying arms to Thailand, to, to, to the Siamese, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and so my, my question is, is, is about, you know, this, this particular working culture of these European colonial companies. Because Light is not alone. Uh, you know, when you look at Robert Clive in India, uh, likewise, cutting deals, you know, uh, uh, um, having several alliances at the same time, which was used, uh, you know, eventually to, to, to defeat uh, Siraj Daula and to defeat the Bengalis and, and the British conquest of, of Bengal. The East India Company, of course, you know, knew that all of this was wrong. But the corporate culture, since we are talking about corporate culture these days, the corporate culture of the East India Company was that we don't care whether you do something wrong as long as you get the territory. And Light, as you know, after he gets Penang through very shady means, yeah, uh, certainly not honest, you know, is then celebrated as a kind of hero. Now, I think you and I have problems with this because of the way in which until today, uh, people like Robert Clive or... Francis Light or, or even Stanford Raffles are celebrated, you know, uh, and, and there's this other side of their biographies which people don't want to talk about. So how, how, what's your position on this? How, how should, especially Malaysians today, yeah, objectively assess someone like Light, who was basically, you know, double dealing everyone and, and, and actually lying in order to get Penang? Yeah, the... the uh... Lingering uh, sentiment over over Penang uh, uh, is 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 more prevalent now. Uh, about 30, 40 years back, they wanted to celebrate uh, the anniversary of light uh, in Penang, but it was objected. Uh, there are still doubts. 
uh, and and uh, if you ask uh, uh, the the people from Penang or, or Kedah, uh, even the, the the letters of Sultan, uh, I think Sultan Ahmad Tajuddin, uh, when he was uh, denied uh, residence in in Penang, he has to go to Malacca. He wrote to Reverend Brighton, saying that uh, I can't even go to the island owned by my father, uh, Tada. He said that I can't even go to the island belonging to my father. So here, the, the thinking is that light, uh, yeah, we cannot deny light landing, but we have to reassess uh, the, the representation of light uh, in the history of the island. And in fact, uh, what, what, what has been done is the mainstream history and historiography of, of Pulau Pina has been cut off from Kedah. Therefore, Therefore, the whole region has been distorted. And uh, 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 saying that, uh, you know, they, they want to say that Light is the founder of Penang. I've been objecting this over, over the decades. Uh, now they have said that uh, Light is the founder of the British settlement in Pulau Pinang. Uh, but then, before he came, this is where the, the, uh, my evidence and, and what I've written, that Georgetown or Tanjung Padanga, the name, uh, was already uh, uh, a port. Uh, and what happened is that British historians and scholars, they amplify and glorify the rule of light. Uh, what can be done is perhaps uh, yeah, to, to, to not to deny, uh, not to throw the statue of French light into the sea, uh, but to put the statue in the museum. It's part of the uh, you know, uh, decolonizing the narrative uh, and, 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 and to look at it, to look at it objectively. It, it's uh, the present historiography of, 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 of the region okay, uh, is exclusive because they do not give agency to those before the coming of the Europeans. So this letters uh, unlike other Malay manuscripts, actually, but this letters and also the Rifles collection is, is empirical evidence giving agency uh, to uh, the geopolitics, to the natives in the geopolitics dynamics of the region, and, and therefore uh, giving, giving enough justification uh, to revise uh, the antecedents of what happened. In other words, uh, we, 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 we we uh, 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 integrate uh, and, and, and make that nation more inclusive. I do not want to, you know, because what happened now is they, 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 they would accuse uh, those, those uh, uh, want to who want to highlight uh, the Malays as being exclusive, but they are being exclusive. So now the point here is that to read it and be inclusive, yeah, that came, yes. He came, he uh, hoisted the flag of the Union Jack, but uh, the narrative is different. So that 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 image, as as you've seen, the popular image of uh, the, the tents in uh, in in the Esplanade, uh, is an image that has deceived the world with regard to the sovereignty of uh, of 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 uh, uh, a territory uh, in the geopolitics of the region. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sir, I think we have a related question to that. Uh, this could, this could be the last question as well. Um, in relation to the discussion this morning, based on the letters, how did the natives play politics in the specific time period, especially in relation to each other? So this is aside from their relations with the Europeans. Yeah. Uh, additional question, and just a curiosity, are there letters that show something related to romantic love? <laughs> the question came from Archil Daug. Uh, okay, I, I go to the, the second question. Yeah, uh, uh, by a Malay lady from Kedah, and uh, they have suspected her to be uh, the uh, to, to have married light. Her name is uh, Siti Sabariah Chaya Alam. Uh, there's several letters, and uh, there's some uh, you know, some romantic things and nuances uh, in the letters, uh, and also the the uh, the letters by the letters by uh, Chek Nina. Uh, uh, to to master okay. uh, where where the 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 Malays uh, among themselves yes uh, see that well again 
um, yeah, some letters in 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 the from Padang and from Sumatra uh, would be uh, letters among themselves uh, collected by Marsden yeah, about uh, war strategy you know, or uh, some some kind of conflict. Uh, but I, I, I will agree with Faris that, that that there's no war, there's no conflict in. In, see, the, the Malays are a peaceful people. We talk about peaceful societies. Uh, it is it is in the Malay capital. It is uh, war is important. We are not belligerent societies. The belligerent societies are the Europeans. They take their belligerency from the Romans, but the people in the archipelago are not belligerent. Right, we want to fight among ourselves. We fight among ourselves, yes, but uh, not a belligerent in, in, in that sense. Even even when when the, uh, you know we we don't like the Dutch or, or the Portuguese, uh, not that we declare war against them. They are you know, backbiting here and there. You know the the if you see some of the Malay Malay uh, hikayats or classic hikayat tanah itu, or you know they would they would uh, say that the Portuguese are better than Dutch, and uh, Dutch are better than Portuguese, uh, the Dutch are womanizers and things like that. So, uh, but I think almost all the letters I I've. Uh, in the Malay, Malay Peninsula would be in response to uh, front strike. Uh, but there's a number of letters from Kelantan and Terengganu. Uh, they would compete one another for three. They want uh, the, the, the Europeans uh, to, to, no, to, to, to trade with one of them. They would say that, oh, the gold in Kelantan is more expensive than Terengganu. So, so come to us. You know that kind of that kind of competition, uh, but otherwise, uh, most of the letters would be in response to to light. But I, I want to qualify this: out of one thousand two hundred letters, uh, eight hundred, roughly, it, some eight hundred would, would be on the relation to to light. The other four hundred will be letters collected by Masden on the activities and the dynamics uh, in Sumatra. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> so uh, due to time constraints, no, one session is not enough to answer all the queries. But as of now, we need to wrap up our session. And for queries, uh, I think uh, they could contact you uh, if uh, they would like to ask personal questions as well. So. Yeah. So uh, thank you, everyone, and especially to our speaker, Dr. Murad, for that very informative and, and enlightening discussion, and to our participants for that very engaging discussion. So we now close this uh, plenary session, and we'll proceed to the next one. Thank you. Terima kasih banyak. Maraming salamat po. Makasih. Our next session is scheduled at 
Good day to everyone. Salamat siyang. Magandang araw. I hope you are doing well to all our panelists, guests, participants, and friends. Welcome to our day one plenary lectures for the Conference of the International Council for Historical and Cultural Cooperation, Southeast Asia, and the 2020 Philippine Historical Association Annual Conference with the team Arrivals, Conflict, and Transformation. Again, I am Wensley Reyes of the Philippine Normal University and a board member of the Philippine Historical Association. I will serve as your moderator for the plenary lecture of our partners from Indonesia. So before we start with the lectures, we would we wish to inform our friends and participants that you could interact with our speakers and ask questions later during the open forum. Just press the raise hand button and wait to be recognized. You may also type your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box. We will try to accommodate as much questions as possible. The open forum will be after the paper presentations. So to begin our session, allow me to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is a lecturer at the Sociology Department, Faculty of Political and Social Science Universitas Nacional Jakarta. He is also active as a national member of the executive board of Masyarakat Sejarawan Indonesia, managing editor of Journal Sejara, and a member of Jakarta's heritage expert team. Our speaker is also a museum curator and supervisor for the development of Oma Munir Human Rights Museum in Indonesia. His interests are concentrated on colonial history, nationalism, and the anti-colonial movement at the turn of the 20th century in the Dutch Indies. To present his paper entitled, Before the Nation State, Anti-Colonial Struggle and Regional Solidarity in Southeast Asia, and, represented, and representing Masyarakat Sejarawa in Indonesia, let us welcome Dr. Andy Aktian. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wensley. Uh, uh, it's a great uh, pleasure for me to be uh, part of this discussion in this session. And first of all, I would like to congratulate my colleagues from the Philippine Historical Association for successfully organizing this conference under the good situation that experience together. Uh, allow me to share my PowerPoint, yeah? <clears throat> Can you read it? Yes, sir. Uh, we can yeah. see your PowerPoint. Yeah. Uh, it is a very interesting for me to participate in this discussion Yeah, uh, with a theme that I think very important in the development of Southeast Asian history and especially in Indonesia history in my field. My presentation will be titled as Before the Nation State, the Transformative Power of Arrival and Encounter. It is a, correct, a correction to previous title in the conference book. Yeah, I, I would like to apologize to, to you. Then, what I want to present here is uh, the transformative power of arrival and encounter between the people in Southeast Asia and the European. And I will limit this process of encounter to the Indonesian and the Dutch experience since the coming of the Dutch trading forces friendly the host in this company or the VOC, the name uh, to Nusantara, yeah, the name of Indonesia uh, at the time, since the mid 17th century onward, that laid the basis for the construction of modern Indonesian today in terms of its boundaries, sovereignty and nationhood today. My argument is that Indonesia as a nation state today was not talk not wholly was the product of long bloody war and military conflict spearheaded since the arrival of the military power to pacify and their end to pacify for suffering rulers in the archipelago. Uh, since first arrival, the Dutch uh, gained uh, 
supremacy in Nusantara due to their stronger naval power, which was the key to their success at the time. But ironically, as they controlled and pacified sovereign states in the archipelago and became the absolute power in the 19th to the 20th century, they transformed themselves into the land power and lost the capacity as naval power in the archipelago in the 20th century. I will come to it later. So uh, my presentation will be divided into two sections. First, I will discuss the, re the realities of political development in the archipelago as represented by the, uh, the greatest monarchs of Mataram Kingdom, Sultan Agung, in the 17th century uh, at the time of the Dutch first arrival. And in the second section, I will uh, discuss how the Dutch transformed themselves from the important sea power in the 17th to 18th century into the land power in the 19th to the 20th century, as well as the consequences of this transfer. So let's let me begin uh, my first section with an intriguing statement by Sultan Agung, the greatest king of Mataram, when he received Dutch envoy to his palace in 1965 in 1914, in 1614, sorry. He said that you can build a fortress in Japara to protect yourself until I can give you a support. I'm not a trader like Tanton and Surabaya kings, and I do not want a customs because I'm already a rich and do not have any shortage at all. I know that you, the VOC envoy, came here not to occupy Jaffa. I have defeated Gresik and Jordan, the eastern part of uh, another small king, uh, kingdom. And I will now defeat Surabaya and I will give Jordan as a gift to the governor general if he wants. And I'm not hostile to Banten, but if they attack you, I will give you a, an aid, Lord, as a reference to their deeds. Uh, I think his statement in this encounter is interesting yeah, for, for two reasons. First, it's so an opposing fact to the popular historical uh, imagination, which of course anachronistic, that put the idea of divider at impera as the main colonial tools to divide and conquer Indonesia. <clears throat> uh, but we can see from, this, from his statement that it was not the case that uh, the suffering as uh, a suffering king, he accepted the, the fiance and uh, expect to build a, a diplomatic relation that will have a use for his uh, uh, agenda. But and we can see here in this picture the area that he gave to the fiance, uh, the Japara in early 18th century. Uh, <clears throat> and it became, uh, uh, we can see how the development in the, of the area, which was transformed into one important uh, trading force uh, for the Dutch in Java at the time. There, was, there were 40 European, five, uh, 500 more Chinese, 100 foreign Orientals, then etc. But it gave the Dutch uh, the advantage that they asked in this meeting. But uh, I think secondly, without any doubt, his statement reflected the a bit of Machiavellian strategy by uh, consolidating his power first before he confronted the Dutch military 50 years through successive, successive military offense to the Dutch main headquarters uh, in Batavia, but both failed. Uh, the question is why he opted for this strategy, diplomatically embraced the Dutch as an ally, so that they became his first enemy. First, my impression is Sultan Agung Setman here offered a nature of pre-colonial politics embraced by suffering states in Nusantara Arlago at the time, turning an enemy into a lie and a lie into enemy or uh, in uh, uh, Bahasa term Sekutu and Seteru, uh, like uh, Orwellian friend, yeah, for the sake of political stability and control 
which was part of the political political game at the time. It reflected that uh, uh, the main problem of traditional state development in Java or maybe in the of time, which uh, like the mandarinate or the sagunate bureaucracy that linked the palace with the villagers support uh, uh, manpower to raise the army as a centralized and state. Java uh, at, and Nusantara at the time resembled a web of suffering power with all suffering states eyeing each other and compete each other for control and supremacy as uh, you can see in the map here. Uh, each suffering has their own territory and their own interests and they, they compete for uh, each, other, each other. By paying attention to this historical context, we will understand Sultan Agung's statement toward the POC and for as part of uh, the priority for his new dynasty that had just emerged at the time and his priority to build internal political stability that could sustain his power. And it it was a, a, a common pattern in that the emerging political first proved that military and political power of the old dynasty they replaced and ensure that there is no, no more potential opposition from the, the old dynasty they replaced. In addition, the Mataram dynasty was also faced with the reality of dealing with rival powers that had not yet position to his kingdom such as Rabaya here you can see in the map <coughs> uh, Tuban as well as Banten and in his in a tradition, he, he, he has to uh, find a foreign ally to confront his internal enemy the Matnasti under Sultan Agung at that time with its center power in Surakarta face a grave political problem experienced by its predecessor in their competition against the economic, political, and military power of their rival. So in this case, it, is, it was important for Sultan Agung to build international relationship that could give him uh, a potential support in case of military expansion. By offering the power to the Dutch in Jepara, the Mataram ruling dynasty tried to secure that they were not having difficulty with the presence of foreign power, while at the same, at the same time, they must wake war to internal enemies. <clears throat> However, Sultan Agung words to the VOC in power was not truly uh, sincere, actually. The Mataram ruler never kept his prom promise to provide assistance for the construction of lodge in Japara, and it was uh, proven that 15 years later, after the first meeting, uh, Mataram launched a massive attack against the VOC main headquarters in Batavia at the time. It seemed that the attack was carried out after Agung think that there was no longer any effective internal force that could destabilize the political power. Prior to the attack, Sultan Agung actually had sent a letter to the Portuguese ruler in Malacca who was the VOC main competitor in the spice trade, requesting support from the Portuguese for the sea attack against Batavia. The request for support again saw us a context about uh, the geopolitical complexities of the archipelago at the time and how the how Sultan Agung calculated and play foreign enemies into his own advantage and advantage. In response to the request, the Portuguese authorities in Malacca think that they will have an opportunity to confront them their main rival and sent a letter to the headquarters in Goa in response to Sultan Agung request. But the support for this response came to be investigation only arrived on February 25, uh, 631, uh, two or three years after the war. And the war uh, is already over and <clears throat> the effort of Sultan Agung military campaign was in uh, failed. Later, we found that Mataram uh, uh, declined from internal dynasty conflict and its power getting more smaller and smaller to the coast due to the cause of civil war and internal power struggle. 
on this regard, uh, we found from this history of first encounter that the archipelago suffering state, I think they, 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 uh, there was no ideas of modernization hood, citizenship or shared long-term interest among the foreign, the suffering state and sultanate in the region. They were already divided power, competing each other. But what we found was a skillful statecraft to contain enemies and manage sovereignties in their own control area. It was the true phase of 17th and I think yeah, extinct political, extinct centuries political realities in Indonesian archipelago at the time. So from this perspective, uh, I wonder uh, in case of the absence of colonial power, colonial power, is it possible that Indonesia came to can such a bureaucratic and state power uh, at that time transform into Indo today Indonesian nation state? Uh, to answer this question, I will move to another section and let me proceed with the uh, section after the Dutch gained total mastery in the archipelago. And what happened then? Uh, yeah, as we saw before, uh, an illustrated uh, map of Nusantara or Indonesian archipelago at the time. Until the mid 17th century, the archipelago was still a complex network of independent powers of kings and princes on each island and on each island and uh, all of them were, were the independent state. And there was an interesting fact that the colonial traditional power actually has never succeeded in establishing a spare of power that can be visualized in the form of modern Indonesian map today. But it did change soon after the Dutch uh, began to took control of the archipelago. The beginning of the formation of Dutch Imperium, uh, we can uh, currently looking back, began with the Dutch fleet led by Cornelis de Otman stopped at several ports around the archipelago and made a topographical map in the area in 15 uh, in the 16th century his expedition was financed by East and in this corporation the voc and was formed the purpose of overseeing trade routes around the archipelago up to sri lanka the cape uh, and the cape of good, good hope then since uh, 1610 the voc under jan fitzson kun began to build a small fort in batavia which in the historical process later became the forerunner to the development of Imperium that controlled almost all the island in the archipelago in the 19th and 20th century. Also from the beginning, the fleet that arrived had the main motivation of controlling the lucrative spice trade monopoly until the end of 17th century VOC representative were involved in serious military intervention in such uh, the case with the Sultan Agung in early alliance with the local indigenous ruler, etc., etc., uh, which gave them territorial claim along the coastal areas as concession granted for their military support. We, we can uh, see in the case of Jepara yeah, with Sultan Agung. On this regard, uh, the superiority of shipping and gunpowder technology has placed the Dutch not only as trader, but also a state entity that had an equal position with traditional rulers in the archipelago at the time. They have the advantage to make territorial claim and increasingly became a new power with a strong position in exercising a trade, mon trade monopoly, monopoly, monopoly in of other a European nations, but the most important starting point in history of that colonialism, which will influence the, the development of Indonesia as nation state today, only start in the 19th century with the arrival of Marshal Daendels, an admirer of French Revolution, who represented Louis Bonaparte, the government in the Dutch in East Indies colony. Daendels came to Java in January 1808 uh, with the task of building the defense systems against the Dutch Indies, against British trade, and 
in accordance with the VOC rules to improve the VOC system and improve the fate of the quote unquote the people from foreign operation. Uh, then there's also uh, contribute to uh, improve the improvement of colonial bureaucracy uh, into the Napoleonic state model of prefecture or residencies in Java. And the most important one is uh, was he introduced an infrastructure project which was popularly, popularly known as uh, Jalan Post, the Rote Postway, linking the most east of Java to the most uh, west. Uh, where the center of colonial bureaucracy resided in Batavia. On this regard, Dundas led the legacy that made the island of Java accessible and uh, from cities among cities connected via lands, which was very difficult in the previous century. This led for the new, this led for the new machinery of uh, colonial exploitation to come the modern capitalist plantation industry in the interior of Java in the early 19th century. On this process, a new form of colonial expansion occurred. Dutch colonial power was no longer has interest in controlling spice road monopoly. They changed into a new system of power that controlled lucrative commodities that were profitable, profitable in the world market. It was under this condition that Java turned into the main producer of sugar commodities in the world, in addition to other important products such as coffee, pinin, cup of milk, and other. In this connection, we can see that in the process of historical development up to the end to the 19th century, a national economic system has emerged, integrating the archipelago economy into one national unity leaving the inter-island trade, which was characteristic of the previous mercantilist period, gone. But behind the scene, <clears throat> but behind the scene of the Dutch success by turning her colony into profitable area, there was also another story, the real story of a successive bloody war of conquest and subjugation that gave birth to what they call Pax Nirlandica, an absolute control of Dutch colonial rule across the archipelago. We can see here uh, the <coughs> uh, in the different successive stages of war conduct, con conducted by the Dutch from Java, Sumatra, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, and uh, Sunda Island in the West Papua. <clears throat> then the question is, what happened then after the Dutch success to, to exploit her colony in the 19th to the 20th century? I think what is the most interesting one was the transformation of Dutch power, a superior naval, superior naval force in the, in the 17th to 18th century into a land force in the uh, 19th to 20th century with the whole areas of uh, Indonesia archipelago under colonial control, control, there was seemingly no need to invest more for naval forces. There are two reasons for this development. First, the colonial army was much more useful for the Dutch to maintain their colonial control as a tool for conquest and oppressed rebellions, mainly in rural areas, peasant rebellion, etc., etc. and Secondly, the Dutch main infrastructure project <clears throat> uh, uh, with uh, building roads and railway that made island of Java easily, easily accessible by land, which provided access to transfer and ship the plantation product from remote island area. Here, the Dutch were also transformed from the marine, the, uh, the process of where the Dutch transformed from the marine power in the 17th century to land power in the 19th to the 20th century. Until the late colonial era, this kind of policy shaped the counter of Dutch colonial policy. 
and the coming of World War II throw into light the reality about the defenseless colony with weak naval forces at the time. And it was no wonder the Japanese easily took, took over the colony from the Dutch without significant resistance. The, but the, the famous uh, Battle of Java Sea only occurred only six hours uh, the Dutch uh, lose in this battle. As a, as a conclusion, uh, I would like to highlight three aspects from the main theme of rival conflict and transformation in the, in the 16th to 19th century in Indonesia. Firstly, I think the encounter was not an easy process here for both sides. It created a new landscape. The most important thing, it created a new landscape of conflict and power struggle in the archipelago that, that every side must, uh, both sides must deal with. And secondly, the main transformation that occurred from this arrival was ironically the birth of the modern Indonesian state today that the Dutch be created with an area stretch from the most west in Aceh to the most east in West Papua. But that, uh, yet, of course, there were bloody history on this, yeah, on this process, but there was also a new beginning from this. And thirdly, the oceanic power was and is still an important aspect, I think, for the archipelagic countries like Indonesia. The control and mastery over the sea remains an important and strategic aspect in the past, present, and the future, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick Bentley. Thank you very much, sir. Terima kasih. <laughs> Terima kasih, terima kasih. Yeah, yeah sama-sama. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andy, for that interesting discussion on transformative power in the history of Indonesia, especially the concepts of nation, state, and sovereignty. Uh, to our participants, you may type your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box. Uh, we will now proceed with our second lecture. Our next speaker earned his doctor degree, doctoral degree in history from Ecole de Youth Etudes Sciences Sociales, or the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences, Paris, with a dissertation entitled um, The Question of Hygiene in the Dutch East Indies Issues on Medicine, Culture, and Social in 2017. Now he teaches history at the Department of History and Philology, Universitas Pajajaran, Indonesia, while he conducts researches on history and sciences and medicines. To present his paper entitled Doctors on Board, Traveling Journal of Colonial Physicians in 19th Century Dutch East Indies, let us welcome Dr. Gani A. Jalani. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Wensley. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to uh, extend my gratitude to Philippine Historical Association for organizing uh, this uh, wonderful conference uh, where we can meet uh, as a Southeast Asian historian, we can meet each other and discuss uh, such uh, very important topics in our, in our study. Uh, the subject that I would like to present uh, this afternoon is about the, the role of physicians in colonial uh, period, which uh, at some point will complete what uh, Andy Adian just uh, explained in the previous speaker. So let me uh, allow me to, uh, to share my screen. Okay. Uh, can you can you see my, my, my screen, my PowerPoint screen? Yes, sir, we could see your presentation. Okay. So uh, as you can see that uh, my, the, the title of my presentation this afternoon is Doctors on Board, Board Traveling Journals of Colonial Physicians in the 19th Century 
that is in this. Uh, <clears throat> The, the presence of physician or surgeons on the board, uh, which travel to discover the new world is, is very known. The VOC's vessel assigned this physician to take care of the ships, uh, to take care of the ship's crew during the travel and after the arrival at the destination. Uh, Jacobus Bontius is one of the very famous uh, physicians working for the company, especially for, for his work on natural history and observation on the health condition in Batavia. Uh, the physician working at the time gave more attention uh, to, the, to the natural history. So uh, my, 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 the, my presentation aims is to, uh, aims to discuss the travel writing by the physicians during the colonial period. It consists of not only objects written uh, in the writing, but also how the physician observe the observe the uh, the local people. I will argue that the attention of the physician changed according to the uh, accord, uh, change according to the changings of imperial politics. In the beginning, the writing of the physician focused on seeking natural resources in order to discover plants that have economics and medicinal values. When the colonial power reached the political stability, the focus of the writing shift to find out the distribution of the disease, the health quality of the region they visited, given the fact that the expedition carried out had the objective to discover whether a region was habitable or not. <clears throat> so, uh, in this occasion, I would like to highlight three uh, events that show uh, the different attention in their writing. The three sections uh, of my presentation will divide uh, based on chronological order, not in the sense that when another ship appears, the other one disappears. They exist together. What I want to show is the appearance of new tendency that need to be, to be noticed. Uh, let me uh, let me begin by uh, telling the story about uh, the event that happened uh, very far from Indonesia. The event that happened in Europe. Uh, there are two major events happened in Europe uh, in the nineteenth century that changed the course of history of the research on natural history in the Dutch East Indies. First, the last contact of La Perouse expedition, uh, expedition, which incited the National Assembly, the French National Assembly, to prepare another expedition in search of this, uh, this group. Second, the French Revolution that turned down the monarchy caused the invalidity of the past letter so that they were obliged to stay in Dutch East Indies as prisoner. These two events mark a turning point in the history of science in Indonesia uh, by, by accidents. The National Assembly assigned uh, Captain Dantre uh, Castro to lead the expedition that was named after him, L'Expedition Dantre Castro, which set sail on 29 September uh, 1791. The mission was to search for Lapyrus. Uh, the mission to search for Lapyrus was failed, but the fate brought them to another end. The expedition arrived in Surabaya on uh, 27 October uh, 1793, but the captain never arrived there, for he died a few months before. Uh, Surabaya was the end of the expedition. First, the French Revolution made the their letter of past invalid. Uh, for the travel, for the, the travel in the name of French king. Second, the fact that there was a uh, war between the Dutch and the French caused the ship's crew to become prisoner. The term was not exact because some people had the permission to carry out a research on natural history, such as La Biardière and Deschamps. First, La Biardière, uh, his 
complete name was uh, Jacques Julien Otto de uh, La Biladière, was born in Alençon, Normandy, in 1755. Uh, he studied botany and medicine at Montpellier under Antoine Bouin. He earned his doctoral degree in the same subject at Paris in 1780. After that year, uh, he made several uh, journey to carry out a research on natural history. First, he went to England to study the collection of Joseph Banks. After that, he went to the Alps and Mont Dauphine, and then spent many years in Syria. He was one of the naturalists who was assigned to the expedition down to the Castro. Another is Louis Auguste Deschamps. He was born at Saint Omer on 22nd August, uh, 1765. Uh, he completed courses of the ancient, medic, uh, ancient medical faculty, the, the Douai, on July 1788. Uh, when expedition set sail on 1791, he didn't have many experience as naturalist. So when the expedition uh, arrived at Surabaya uh, on October uh, 1793, they could not continue the journey because uh, the event that happened in Europe, the French Revolution, that provoked a tension between the Dutch and the French, uh, La Biardier and another crew had to stay in Surabaya. He took this opportunity to enrich his collection on natural history. For this purpose, he asked permission to the city authority uh, to conduct uh, research in the mountain around Surabaya. So from his travel journey, we could read that uh, he went to Mount Prau and uh, before, uh, on the way he visited several villages where he was welcomed by local people and served local food. During this journey, he was accompanied by Dutch army and local people. Speaking of, about uh, their companion, he said that the Dutch always wanted to show the authority, while the Javanese this didn't seem interested in the activity. Uh, the Javanese, according to him, were always on the horse during this journey. One day, the Javanese suddenly got down from the horse and raced to pick a plant called Kadiar Ankri. One of them explained that this plant contained an aprodias, which local people use as medicine. Uh, this interaction, this interaction is one example on how the journey passed. And from this interaction, La Biardire enriched his knowledge not only on natural history, but also uh, on, local, on local culture. Unlike, unlike La Biardire, Deschamps managed to carry out a research to the interior of Java. After being transferred to Smarang from Surabaya, while, while La Biardire waiting to awaiting a decision to be transferred to, Sura, to Batavia, he could, uh, so he could take a ship to return to France. Desham was offered by Governor Van Ostersenger at the time to stay in Jaffa and to conduct a research on natural history. The Dutch authority even supported him with all facilities so he could carry out the, carry out the research into the interior of the island. Desham accepted this offer and took leave his traveling uh, companion. Uh, Desham left Sumarang on 8 May uh, 1795 to start his travel and ended it in 1798 when he arrived at Batavia. So from uh, 1798, he became surgeon uh, in Batavia until uh, 183 when he went back to uh, uh, to French. From his uh, voyage, he published two articles, one about the Upas tree and the other about the uh, extract of his voyage uh, to, to Java. Desham tells the story about the custom of the Japanese who punished the criminal by sending them to the forest where uh, there was a poisonous plant called Upas. Unlike uh, Unlike uh, his predecessor, uh, N.P. Force, a surgeon of VOC, who published an article description of the poison tree in the island of Jaffa, in which he wrote much on the myth of this tree, Deschamps tried to separate the myth and the science. His writing focused on the material contained in the upas tree that was used as poison. 
the interaction with local people allow him to acquire the knowledge more precisely. His essay on UPAS was continued by Leshino de Latour a few years later. What I want to say by telling the story of these uh, two French naturalists is that uh, both of them paved the way to carry out the research by doing a journey into the area and the interior of Java, which will be continued in the next uh, uh, in the next uh, century. Uh, and now I get to my second uh, part of my presentation. It's about exploring the interior of Java. This is a naturalist in the early uh, 19th century. So the changing of century at some point means the changing of uh, changing type of research and the form of travel writing. First, the travel was planned. This is uh, unlike the, the French naturalist when he came to, to Java because, the, uh, because their ship was stranded in Surabaya. Uh, this species naturalist uh, planned to, to, to do a research, uh, a travel into the interior of Java. Second, it continued to study the interior of Java by traveling far, far, very far to the interior. This is very interesting because the physicians Walking at the time came to the Dutch as Indy, first of all, as a physician. So the first is uh, Thomas Horsfield. He was an American physician and naturalist who came to uh, Netherlands Indy in 1801 and stayed there until 1819. In 1804, he made a research trip through Java and this lasts until 1812. Uh, and during his trip, he sent specimen to the Batavia North South, the Kunsten and Wittenschapen. Uh, in 1811, he met Ralphus who employed him. His general interests include the research, not only plant mineral, but also the custom uh, of the population of uh, this region. He published his work. Uh, his published work could be, uh, uh, could be uh, read in the journal for handling Van Batavia North South, the Kunsten and Wittenschapen especially in the year uh, 1814 and 1816. Uh, One of the important article is uh, a title about the short account of the medicinal plants of Java, where he wrote the medicinal plants that had been already introduced into the European system of Materia Medica and the medicinal plants which are employed in the daily practice of the Japanese uh, or natives. In writing this medicinal plants of Java, uh, it is worth noting that Dr. Horsfield put also the local name of the plant uh, in this article. He explained the use of this plant for medical purpose. Uh, as he already mentioned that not all the plants in Java were classified in Materia Medica, but he made some experiment on several plants which uh, were still not recognized yet by the system, used by local people as, as medicine. Uh, he said that the series of experimental inquiry, which is necessary to elucidate fully the virtue and qualities of our native medicinal plants depend on the joint labor of many physicians from the practice of the natives, but little is to be learned. They employ the substance empirically without any regard to quantity. Their ignorance in the science of medicine renders them incapable of observing the action of many any substance into a human system. Uh, and of the quote, there was uh, the quote from Dr. Horsfield who criticized the way uh, the local people, the native use the, the medicinal plant. So uh, speaking of the medicinal plant and it, uh, there was another uh, physician called Carl Ludwig Bloom, uh, who is very important figure in, in this research. He was a physician working in the Netherlands Indies as an inspector of vaccination, who had made a lot of journey to the different regions in Java. He used these trips uh, to collect the materials of the natural world in the Netherlands Indies. During this trip, he collected a large number of living and dry plants and seeds, which eventually formed the basis for a series of botanical studies. So uh, there is an article uh, he write uh, about uh, a plan when 
it came from his writing, travel writing, when he went to Mount Salak uh, in the year in 1822. That uh, he talked about uh, a plan called Magnolisen. The description about Magnolisen is one of example in his writing. Uh, he said that uh, this plan is, uh, uh, there is no explanation about the, uh, about the power of the plan as a medicinal plan, but he is quite sure because uh, he saw a lot of native people use that as, uh, as medicine. So, uh, It is uh, important also to highlight the fact that the information gathered in the article written by uh, Bal by Bloom on his journey to, to Mount Salak. Uh, he wrote a lot of uh, thing about uh, the interaction with the, the local uh, with the local people. So this gives impression that Bloom play, Bloom plays a role as a physician and botanist at the same time, while we know that at the time he was appointed the director of botanic garden in Buiton so, uh, The similarity between Bloom and uh, Horsfield is that both of the physicians tried to acquire the knowledge from, from local, from the native, while at the same time try to criticize, criticize it uh, comparing to the way the Western uh, knowledge. Uh, at this point, the encounter between the local people, the native and the European, it's, it's quite uh, dialectical in the sense that at some point, the European learned a lot from the, 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 the native. So it is uh, very different when we talk about the, the position walking in the mid 19th century. Because uh, at the time, uh, the focus was the military expedition uh, uh, in order to survey a potential colony. So first of all, uh, uh, there, 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 there are two things in the mid 19th century of the Dutch Indies that I have to clarify first in order to understand the tendency of the physician in the mid 19th century. First, the implementation of culture stelsel, system of culture, uh, which in Indonesian historiography is known as system tanam paksa, in which every peasant had to provide one five of their land to cultivate the plant that has an economic value in international market. The establishment of this system show to what extent the colonial government systematized the economic exploitation of the colony. Secondly, the colonial authority planned to extend their colony to the island outside Java. From this two situation, the physician works were intended to assure, to assure the colonization by uh, guaranteeing the health of the worker. Knowing one area with their health quality became one of the main occupation of the physicians at, at that period. And the, the, the type of expedition at the time was a military one. This military expedition involved always physicians who had a task to treat the sick crew members in that group. This expedition had the objective to survey an area which had a potential for establishing a new colony. The physicians in that expedition report the health condition of all the crew. When arrived at the destination, they will give a description of the distribution of disease in that place. To, as, to assure the, the health condition of the members of the expedition, they would instruct the workers to build a hospital, simple one, of course, so that they could continue working to examine the sick one. The description of local people is always mentioned in their writings. Um, Dr. Honius, for example, took part in the, in, the, in the expedition to give the description about the health condition of Dayak people. Uh, in his writing, he mentioned in many places the way these local people live, what they eat, what they wear, and <clears throat> etc. Another physician called uh, Van Andringa relate in his writings that when he arrived to a kampung, to a village, the inhabitants fled away because they were scared of the foreign people coming to their place. The only remaining people were the sick ones. So, 
this is kind of type of expedition, military expedition uh, in the mid 19th century. But uh, the most famous military uh, expedition accompanied by a physician was the military expedition to Aceh. Uh, it was an example to what extent the work of physician is to assure the health of the crew. For some of you who probably are not familiar with the Indonesian history, the Aceh War was begun uh, uh, began in 1873 and was the longest and most difficult for the Dutch. The military expedition to confront the Aceh involved the positions to assure the, the health of the soldier. The course of the war was determined as well by the outbreak of beriberi, a disease which caused the defeat from uh, the Dutch side in the beginning of, of the war. So another is uh, the travel, uh, travel writing to Bali uh, by Dr. Jacobs was an essay to study anthropology and health condition of the people. His writing is very elaborated as he treated uh, many subjects related to the culture of the, of the Balinese. Dr. Jacobs gave special interest to work ethnography. After the publication of his travel writing to Bali, he published another two books about the uh, Badui, the inhabitant of West Java, a Sundanese, and, and the Aceh. These two books were written not in the format of travel account, but it is more an ethnography in which uh, the chapter were classified according to the subject of the, of the discussion. So uh, to, to summarize uh, my, my presentation, I want to highlight three points. First, the, the writing of the physicians allow us to see the complexity of the contact between the European and the, and the local people. In the early writing, the local people were presented several times as the source of knowledge. As we can see from, uh, we can read from La Billardière, uh, how he uh, get the knowledge about a plant called Kajar, Ang uh, Kajar Angri, which has a uh, quality, uh, which has some uh, medicinal plants. Another with uh, Bloom or Horsfield, they learn a lot of things from the, from the natives. While after the mid 19th century, uh, the local or the native, they became the object of study and curiosity. So this is a shift that is very, very important in the writing of the physician. Uh, this doesn't mean that the first travel writing didn't have any curiosity, of course. Uh, of course they had, but the object of the observation was not the same. Uh, for example, when Louis-Auguste Deschamps write about the culture of, uh, uh, of Java, uh, the culture of Java, when he made his uh, trip, to Java, he, he described the way of the Japanese live from the physical uh, appearance, uh, what they eat, uh, what they al almost uh, do every day. But that's all. Uh, it is kind of different when we read a physician who write uh, such as uh, Dr. Jacobs. Uh, he writes something like, uh, netographic uh, work. The second, uh, second, uh, sec my second point is this shifts in writing the object of the study could be explained by the fact that the objective of the travel has changed, of course. In the mid 19th century, the focus of the expedition was to extend a colony. Uh, and maintain the existing power while in the first, uh, the early 19th century or in the late 18th century, it was kind of the expedition in order to, uh, to carry out a research on natural history. So, and my, my last point in this presentation is uh, it is very important uh, to, to, to discuss more about this encounter uh, using different sources because uh, what I presented 
uh, just now, it was about uh, I, I use uh, the the European sources, but I tried to uh, make uh, to read it uh, different uh, di differently. But I think it is uh, it will be more uh, important if we use another uh, source, local source, uh, Japanese or even Sundanese or another uh, another another manuscript from another uh, region. So to enrich uh, how the complexity. Uh, the the complexity of the encounter between European and uh, and the and the local people. I think that's all. Uh, terima kasih. Thank you very much, Dr. Gani, for that informative discussion on the connection of history, medicine, and colonization. Uh, at this point, we are now open. We are now opening the floor for your queries. So may I request our speakers, Dr. Andy and Dr. Gani, to open their cameras as well, and allow me to read some of the comments as well as que the questions posted by our part by our participants. So I think Dr. Andy al already answered one of the questions. <laughs> okay. So uh, I have to hear of to Dr. Andy. A uh, very informative discussion. Uh, we see parallelism with other colonial experience in Southeast Asia. Anti-colonial studies regret colonial contribution to state creation. Uh, would it be safe uh, to say that Indonesia is a colonial creation? <laughs> and to Dr. Gani, a nice presentation to see history in a different perspective. Uh, physicians in general may be uh, seen as neutral people because their mission is to cure. But would it be safe to say that they, they, especially colonial doctors, also contributed to the colonial rule and exploitation of the country by maintaining and strengthening the stronghold of colonizers to the natives or the local people? So, uh, okay. Thank you for the... Uh, Sir Gani, would you like to go first? Okay, so yeah, I think I'll Gani, yeah, okay, Gani. Hmm? Gani or? Oh, Andy, Andy first. Okay. okay, thank you for the oh, question. Uh, okay, Sir Andy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very interesting that, yes, of, uh, I think so that uh, also it, is, it, will, it will be uh, uh, as if we have no sense of patriotic things, but uh, in terms of boundaries, I think yes, it, it is. A, it was a Dutch creation, but I think one one important thing is uh, more than the boundaries or territories that uh, because the creation of a modern state need a, a much more complex uh, components such as uh, nationhood, the position of uh, citizenship. And uh, that's the main ingredient. I think that uh, even the Indonesians, uh, founding father, had difficulties to uh, to develop uh, before uh, before the fall of the Dutch uh, colonial regime at the time. So uh, they try to make uh, such a kind of what kind of the common ground for our nation state uh, for the future and that's why they discuss and uh, with the result of Pancasila, the idea of Pancasila, uh, the state uh, ideal as an uh, ideal world and home, yeah, uh, the point of view about the reason we become uh, uh, one nation, Indonesian nation, beyond the beyond the boundaries or the territories, then I think it is much more important today to, to think again to what extent that our citizenship, our nationhood cons, uh, related to uh, wider or bigger problems that we encounter today. I think it's, yeah, that's uh, my comment to the question. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wensley. Okay, 
thank you for the 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 questions. Uh, first, I would like uh, to say that yes, uh, the positions uh, in colonial period uh, during colonial period has a very uh, special role in uh, in maintaining the colonial power. The discussion about I think there are a lot of uh, article or work about the. Uh, uh, about the colonial tool in which uh, include uh, in which uh, the physician was included uh, in that study. In case of uh, Indonesia, I think uh, we could we can see it's very uh, very clear that uh, in the mid 19th century, uh, the colonial authority start to open a school for school for uh, for, for, for for native uh, to. To be trained as uh, uh, not a physician, uh, but more like an assistant to physician. It was in eight, mid 19th century, but uh, and at that period there were a lot of uh, works on what we call uh, medical topography or uh, medical uh, geography. It is a study of uh, an area, a very specific area. Uh, in, uh, in which the, the physician tried to describe the, the health, the quality, the health condition of, uh, of uh, this, this place. And so uh, the European could uh, make a choice where to live when they arrive in the Netherlands in this. And another, a more, I think uh, in more specific way in, uh, in um, uh, 1857, I think, uh, there was also a recommendation, uh, a debate about uh, the possibilities of the European to live in, uh, in the tropical zone. It was uh, the physician who gave, uh, gave the, the recommendation. Uh, it is safe to live in tropical zone, but you have to choose uh, 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 you have to uh, avoid uh, living uh, in the uh, coastal area, uh, something something like that. So at some point, yes, the position was uh, have a very uh, uh, important role in colonial, even if it is if it is not much uh, discussed the political role of the of the position. I think that's. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, may we request Mam Gemma to, um, she's raising her hand. <laughs> Maybe she has questions to our speakers. Mam Gemma. Good afternoon. Can you see me? Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. I can hear you. I can hear you. Uh, well, my question is, were there any epidemics during that time, that time period the professor is talking about? Hello? Dr. Yeah. Gani, I think. Okay. Uh, oh, okay, I, I, I answer it uh, directly. Okay, yes, there was uh, several uh, epidemics at that time in the early, uh, uh, in the 1822 uh, or 23, there was, uh, there, uh, there was uh, an outbreak of, uh, cholera in in Jaffa. Uh, it is uh, the, the colonial authority was uh, uh, get got the letter from uh, the consulate in another place that they were an outbreak, uh, but they uh, they didn't take care of uh, uh, the letters, so the, the outbreak mm -hmm. happened, and. Uh, <clears throat> Regarding to, to uh, Dr. Bloom that I mentioned in my presentation, actually, mm -hmm. Dr. Bloom uh, write uh, a very important book about this uh, called Cholera. It was published mm -hmm. in uh, 1832. And he's writing based on his uh, ex uh, experience uh, how to treat the cholera in, in Java. It is very interesting because at that time, Dr. Bloom uh, tried to uh, to mix his knowledge 
as uh, for someone who is trained as a physician in Europe, uh, and to mix the knowledge between what he acquired, how the local people, how the native uh, uh, use the the plant to uh, to cure uh, cholera. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. What about the uh, berry berry plague? Uh, the berry, did that, yeah, did the that berry reach berry. Indonesia? Yeah, it, it happened when uh, exactly when the uh, when the Dutch made first uh, expedition to uh, uh, war expedition against mm -hmm. again again Aceh. Uh, at, at the time, uh, the most of the Dutch soldier, not the Dutch, uh, the the native uh, soldier who worked for the Dutch, were the mm -hmm. most suffer from the berry berry, uh, and because oh, at the see. time there was uh, the 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 native uh, soldier uh, ate a different food than the than the the European uh, soldier, and berry mm -hmm. berry was very uh, important because. Uh, uh, the, now you know the, the Dutch was defeated uh, by the Aceh, and for this, he asked to uh, to uh, to physician to, uh, from Europe to come to uh, Indonesia mm -hmm. to conduct a uh, research. Uh, it was uh, Peckel Herring, Cornelis Peckel Herring, uh, mm -hmm. the one who uh, uh, he was a physician. Who who learn much in Robert Koch laboratory before he, he came to uh, before, he, before he came to to, to to Java and at the time in 1880 at the time uh, the uh, uh, the tendency in uh, the tendency in medicine was uh, the appearance of the bacteriological paradigm so mm -hmm. uh, and as a disciple of uh, Robert Koch, uh, Peckel Herring told that uh, berry berry was caused by a bacteria, uh, a very specific pathogen. So, uh, so for that he created a laboratorium. He uh, carried out several ex uh, experiments just to search. Uh, to mm -hmm. determine a very specific pathogen, but in the end, he didn't arrive to the very specific conclusion, mm -hmm. and because we already know berry berry is, is not caused by a uh, bacteria, it is a nutritional. Uh, yes, object. because in the Philippines, uh, the doctors found out it was caused by a lack of vitamin B from eating a uh, uh, over polished rice. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that that yes. that's the same, and that uh, it was uh, uh, Doctor Eichmann, the assistant of Peckel Herring, Doctor Peckel Herring, who mm -hmm. who finally found out, uh, discovered uh, that berry berry was caused by uh, the lack of uh, vitamin. Yes. Well, it was startling to hear you say that the military forces, the Dutch military forces, were accompanied by doctors and not by missionaries like the military forces here. Um, yeah, uh, maybe. Uh, I think there are, uh, uh, there are also the, the missionary in the, uh, in the, uh, in the expedition, but I put some emphasis on the role played by the the, the, the physicians because you know that's my uh, my area of, uh, of of research. I want just want to put some emphasis how important mm -hmm. the role of uh, uh, play by the physician in forming the. Uh, for informing uh, colonial knowledge that uh, mm -hmm. used to colonize the uh, uh, colonize the, the, the uh, Indonesian people. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, you're, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Mam Gemma. Uh, we have uh, questions here. Um, let me read some. So for Dr. Andy, 
Uh, aside from wars and battles, how did the local react to the transformative power? Did they also mold their this power or use this power to suit their own agenda? For Dr. Gani, uh, this is from Ma'am Maria Nella Florendo. Aside from the conduct of research on natural history, did the traveling physician also engage in medical practice in Java? Were the epidemics in Java during the colonial period and were the services of these traveling physicians stopped? Did they have indigenous or native apprentice? Thank you. So uh, Dr. Andy first, followed by Dr. Yanni. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question and uh, it is quite, I'm not quite sure, yeah, but the, the way uh, another, another kind of reaction or uh, encounter between, I guess, uh, the net uh, coming of European maritime power in Southeast Asia, I think. The area of uh, Southeast Asia were already a cosmopolitan uh, area, yeah, with the Chinese, the Arab, uh, India, or even maybe the European, and uh, and the uh, was based on trading, uh, uh, which uh, put them in equal relationships, yeah. But I think at the time, uh, at the turn of the 17th to 18th, 19th century, uh, the problem was uh, different because first uh, they they were uh, there was a, a a drive to monopolize or control the area which uh, uh, and supported by the military expansion that that's the, the the problem in 19th and the 20th century of uh dutch control at the time yeah uh so that that's why uh uh it is quite uh, difficult for me to find uh, another kind of uh, uh reaction beyond the war of course after the war after the that settled in the archipelago and they have an, another mission like uh, missionaries or or uh, gani explained such a gani explained a doctor something like that they, they were they they, they, they were uh, another type or more more peaceful cooperation yeah shared interest with uh, uh, the same problem but uh, in the main again, uh, we also saw uh, the big picture of uh, the process of colonization supported by the military expansion of Dutch uh, colonial power at the time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, were there uh, a physician who also practice a medical uh, medical practice? while they conduct a research on natural history. Yes, there are a few of them who did that, uh, such as uh, Louis Auguste Pichons, uh, the French uh, that I mentioned in my presentation. He was a uh, physician uh, during, uh, during his days in, uh, in Java. Uh, he was uh, appointed as a physician in, in Batavia. Another was uh, Ludwig uh, Bloom, Carl Ludwig Bloom, also, I mentioned in my, my presentation, he, uh, he, he was also a physician and more than that, he was uh, an inspector of uh, a vaccine, vaccination, who, uh, who, uh, who did, uh, who went to, from one village to another to give a vaccination to the, to the, to the people. And during that, uh, uh, during that travel, he, uh, he did, uh, a natural, a natural research, and both the uh, apprentice and disciple. A very specific one, I didn't find. I didn't find any, 
but uh, as I already mentioned in the mid 19th century, uh, in, to be exact, that is um, 1852. There was a uh, school for uh, uh, for physician or for medicine uh, for the for the native to be trained as uh, assistant to uh, to to physician. But uh, I could say that during the the journey. Uh, 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 the the position you need to to uh, to carry out the research on natural history. Uh, they uh, they were always accompanied by a local uh, by local uh, by local people. So uh, that's that's why, uh, for example, when uh, Dr. Thomas Horsfield wrote about the medicinal plants. Uh, he put beside the European name uh, a local or local name. The question is from whom did uh, Thomas Horsfield get the knowledge about uh, the name of the of the plants? And also, uh, what uh, from whom uh, Thomas Horsfield or even Bloom or another physician get the knowledge about the uh, uh, the the uh, the the the, quali uh, the potential uh, of every plants they describe in in, the, in their writing, they acquired that's all from the local knowledge. So uh, that's I think that's I hope that's uh, answer the question. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, we have some comments here. I do not know if this is intended for Dr. Andy or Dr. Yanni, but uh, the comment states that to Dr. Akdian, the dates of the establishment of medical schools and pharmaceutical studies in Indonesia. So he is asking if uh, when the uh, medical schools were first established in Indonesia, so the dates of first medical school and pharmacy graduates, no name of universities, if there is a name of universities with medical and pharmaceutical colleges. Yeah, I think maybe this is also I related. Think question, with, I think the question is uh, yes, for me. Yes, I think, yeah. I think for Ghani. <laughs> so for the uh, medical schools, uh, which is not really a medical school, uh, as I already uh, mentioned earlier, uh, it was uh, established in 1852. The, the, the real uh, medical school, it was laid in, uh, in 19, uh, 1925, if I'm not mistaken, but it was laid in early uh, 20th century. The real medical school, which give, uh, which give a diploma, uh, which give an MD. But before that, it was uh, just a train, uh, a place to train a local uh, a native to become an assistant to European physician. And for the pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical studies, uh, it, uh, the, uh, the institution itself, uh, the, an independent institution for the pharmaceutical studies. I think we can, we can uh, only see it later in the early 20th century, alongside with the establishment of the medical school. But uh, if you talk about the, uh, the laboratory, very important uh, laboratory in, in colonial uh, in colonial period, we could, uh, I could uh, mention uh, there was a laboratory for uh, pharmaceutical studies, uh, which is uh, an institution is part from the botanical garden in Buitenzo. So there is a branch in botanical garden which is specifically study about the uh, about the plant that has uh, potential in, uh, uh, in 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 medical in medical use, and it was established in uh, 18, uh, 18, uh, 1890, late in the late 19th century for a pharmaceutical laboratory. When Thank you. Yes, yes, ma'am. Can I, uh, can I uh, pose a question to Gani? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Uh, Gani, uh, you speak of uh, sort of medicalization. I'm curious about uh, whether you had a school of midwifery in Batavia. 
And um, what was the position of the traditional midwife uh, as against the uh, trained midwife? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, there, uh, beside the establishment of the uh, medical school or institution to train uh, native uh, uh, assistant uh, positions, there was also established uh, what we call a midwifery uh, school. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, one of the reasons of this establishment is that there were a lot of uh, the, the number of the newborn uh, baby, uh, that uh, baby is very, very high. And from the report of the European physician, they uh, they, 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 they always give a description about how horrible uh, the, the process of the giving birth, uh, assisting by, uh, by the native, uh, un, uh, untrained native uh, midwifery, what we call uh, Dukun Dukun Ana. So, uh, I think uh, even so there was a uh, new establishment in midwifery. Uh, there was uh, established a midwifery school in the mid 19th century, but uh, the number until early 19th, uh, 20th century, the number of its uh, graduation is very, uh, very, uh, very small. And uh, among the very small uh, number, it's only uh, we can only found them in uh, in the big in the big city because in the late report in the 19th century uh, when we talk about uh, giving birth in a small village uh, it was uh, there's always uh, the the local the native uh, the, the native dukun who always assist to uh, for giving birth Interesting because you know, Gani, I noticed that the Dukon Bayi was more popular than the licensed midwife, and it was the same in the Philippines during the 19th century. The Hilot, the Filipino Hilot, or the traditional uh, mm -hmm. midwife, was more popular than the matrona titular or the licensed. So I think um, that similarity is something that. Uh, it's interesting to look at how tradition uh, persists uh, amidst uh, an attempt to medicalize childbearing. You know? So uh, it's interesting that we have the same and we share the same experience. Thank yes. you. Yes, I agree. Uh, I agree with you. The, the, the Dukun Anak is uh, more, uh, more popular. Uh, uh, and then the train midwife, uh, uh, European train midwife. So uh, to to see uh, the the comparison, the experience uh, between Philippines and Indonesia, even after the the tentative, the, the essay of medicalization by the colonial, there's it's never. Uh, it never goes very, uh, very, uh, very, very smooth. There is always uh, yeah, in context very, very, very complex. Thank you, sir. So, uh, I, yes, ma'am. Let we have other questions. Okay. Thank you. I thank you. So, uh, other questions here to Dr. Andy. Uh, politics and economy are connected. You mentioned the creation of trains as major transportation of Indonesia. How did it transform Indonesia? And to Dr. Uh, Ghani, uh, did the colonizers use the medical profession for their colonial interests? He's just curious. And did the knowledge gained by European physicians about the medical plants found in Indonesia impacted Western medicine? In what way? Uh, thank you. Excuse me, can you repeat the, the question? Uh, again? For I, Dr. I, Andy, politics and economy are connected. You mentioned the creation. 
uh, politics and economy are connected. You mentioned the creation of trains as major transportation of Indonesia. How did it unify or transform Indonesia? Is that clear, sir? Sir Andy? Yeah, 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 okay. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, it is very interesting to note the, the, the development of uh, transportation system yeah, be, uh, beside the uh, already uh, marit maritime uh, network or sea shipping uh, network in the Dutch Netherlands in the other time and uh, the railway it, I think was uh, uh, one important thing that changed uh, uh, the nature of uh, connection or, or how the movement of people at the time yeah uh, uh, one study found that the uh, uh, railway transportation much more effective that in bringing uh, more people into uh, different town, different cities that provide them with the uh, uh, ideas about larger picture of the society uh, or their, their social background at the time. And one interesting point is the lower people much more, uh, uh, what is the railway, uh, the main passenger was were came from the lower person. Yeah, uh, they 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 use it for trade uh, trade activities or uh, economic other economic activities, finding work in other towns, something like that. Compared with the low, the higher uh, person, or we call the priyai, who are who are much more uh, what is immobile. They just put under uh, in one area and then. And they, they just uh, sit in this uh, small town or something like this. But the common people who who made use it uh, more efficiently, and and I think it uh, it become uh, one uh, important aspect that transformed the ideas of uh, com uh, imagine community of larger than their their, their uh, village or their town, something like that. Yes, it, it, it has uh, an interesting uh, effect for transformative power in the in terms of cultural or political uh, ideas at the time. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Andy. Yes. Okay. Uh, the question was, uh, is, uh, did the colonizer use the medical profession for their colonial interests? Uh, I can say that yes, uh, uh, in the way, in the direct way, or not. I can, uh, I, I could give you an example of the establishment when the, uh, the establishment of the Sumatra East plantation. Uh, it is very uh, quite uh, uh, popular plantation, uh, rubber rubber plantation. Uh, uh, the productivity of the the productivity of the worker was determined by the intervention of the physician. The physician who worked there, uh, Schuffner and Quinnen, uh, when they came to the plantation, first of uh, first thing uh, he uh, did was to construct. Uh, the hospital and good establishment to for the worker, and also a, a good latrine, and uh, the hospital was must be centralized. And uh, uh, at some point, uh, these two uh, physicians create a system that will make sure that the worker will always in a good health and to avoid uh, the outbreak of any uh, epidemics. So when there was, uh, when there was uh, a critics about the, uh, the implementation of what we call poenal uh, sanksi, a severe punishment, because the, uh, the, the, the plantation owner in, Sum uh, in East Sumatra has the total authority 
uh, for the worker. So uh, it is, uh, and it was regulated by the law called uh, a point of sanction when the uh, when liberal politician in Dutch uh, and in in Indonesia at that at the time period had criticized the, the implementation of point of uh, sanction. It was the physicians who against uh, who against. Uh, uh, or against those uh, liberal politicians, because for the position, the implementation of final sanctions is very important to uh, to assure that uh, the that the worker uh, uh, will be treated uh, every time they 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 uh, they, they see. So at some point, yes, uh, uh, the colonizer use medical medical uh, profession, especially especially in uh, Sumatra is plantation. Uh, another uh, another question was uh, is uh, the knowledge gained by the European patient about the medicinal plant from Indonesia impacted Western medicine? Until the mid 19th century, uh, it was. Uh, I can say until the mid 19th century because at that time uh, the uh, the interaction, the dialectic, uh, the uh, between the European physicians and the local uh, the local healer, from whom the European physician acquired the knowledge about uh, uh, medicinal plant plantation, is very quite quite intensive. And even in the in the physician writing, the name of the local healer is very rare, uh, rarely mentioned. Uh, but uh, in the in the end of the 19th century, when there was uh, uh, what we call uh, bacteriological uh, tendency in medicine, where every physician uh, where uh, understand the way uh, that uh, a disease was caused by a very specific pathogen, and the way to cure it is how to kill that very specific pathogen. At the time. Uh, the, uh, the the interaction between European physician and local healer is uh, no more uh, no 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 more no more established. And at the time, the, it seems that the European uh, physician uh, feel more superior uh, in terms of medical knowledge and something that we didn't find it. I think at some point in the early of 19th century. Thank you very much. I know our participants would like to ask more questions to our speakers, <laughs> but we have limited time. So I think you could just communicate with our speakers via their email or by, by a Facebook. Okay. Now they are now intellectual rock stars. So to our speakers, Dr. Andy and Dr. Gani, our gratitude for sharing your time and intelligence in expanding our current historical knowledge and, under, and, on, and our understanding of Southeast Asia. To our friends from Masyarakat Sejarawan Indonesia, terima kasih banyak. And um, also to our uh, friends from the Persatuan Sejarah Malaysia, uh, terima kasih. So we formally close this plenary session and thank you for your active participation. Uh, terima kasih banyak, maraming salamat and have a, have a good day. So to give the synthesis, uh, let us listen to one of our board members uh, and a faculty member of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, Professor Gloria E. Melencia. I'm glow. Okay, so while waiting, uh, we would like to again uh, give our sincerest um, gratitude to, to Dr. Andy and to, to, to Dr. Gani. Terima kasih. Uh, terima terima kasih. Kasih so do you have other, terima sir? Kasih. Do you have other, uh, any closing remarks for uh, participants? me yeah uh, i would like to say thank you for 
all of your attention and participation in this discussion. And it is my honor yeah, to, to represent the uh, Masyarakat Sejarawan Indonesia. And on behalf of Masyarakat Sejarawan Indonesia, I congratulate uh, our colleagues from the Philippine Historical Association as well as the Persatuan Sejarah Malaysia. Uh, and thank you for you all. Terima kasih. Selamat sore. It's a very productive discussion. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sir Yani. Yeah, uh, I would like also once again to extend my gratitude to the organizer of this conference for having us uh, here in this very uh, wonderful conference, very productive because uh, we share a lot of things. I, uh, uh, I attend from the first uh, session this morning through Facebook uh, and until now, I think it is very important for us as a uh, South Asian scholar to organize more uh, such kind of, of conference and in which we could elaborate a new source to our study and uh, also the way we read uh, the sources in case we do only have uh, European sources, how to read it all. I think that is uh, very important and very productive. And once again, I would like to thank to you all uh, for having us in this uh, very uh, uh, wonderful conference. Terima kasih banyak. Thank you very much. Uh, please be reminded also tomorrow, uh, the session will begin at 8 a.m. And um, I think it will be like this, no? very informative discussion, very engaging discussion of uh, topics related to our theme for this year. So may I request anyone from our uh, friends from PHA? Yes, to... I'm now here. Ben. Yes, Hi. yes ma'am. So, yes, yes ma'am. So again, to give the synthesis, uh, let us listen to Professor Gloria E. Melencio of the University of the Philippines and board member of uh, PHA. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, fellow educators, um, members of the uh, Philippine Historical Associations and uh, plenary speakers. Today's uh, plenary lectures focused on the need to change perspectives and narratives in the way historians and educators view and tackle history from Southeast Asian lens. Dr. Faris Ndor explained that the 30-year war that was fought in Central Europe between 1618 and 1648 was a landmark event in the collective Southeast Asian history. One has to see the entanglements as he turned it to know how Southeast Asia became a battlefield in its own seas for powerful and distant European countries such as Spain, Britain, France, and Holland. The aftermath of the 30-year war witnessed the birth of new nations. Holland, for example, rose to uh, establishing its Dutch East India Company or the VOC, a militarized entity that spearheaded the commercial capital driven colonization of Amboina and Batavia, among others. Powerful rivals emerged likewise after the French Revolution in the 18th century. These European wars brought in the Southeast Asian seas had eased out our ancestors in the global picture as they lose control of the seas. Amid rivalries though, Southeast Asia was able to develop a sense of normalcy and have always been finding a way to coexist with one another. This is common with Dr. Ariel Lopez's analysis that the Malay Indonesian world continued to be connected with Sulu and Maguindanao in the Philippines. 
the Muslims remain close to the Mali world to this day. Professor Ambeto Campo in studying pre-colonial and colonial maps noted how schools or the education system itself has been making divisions not only on the territoriality of places but more so on the narratives in history. He explained that maps aside from aiding us in tracing our history from being a colony to becoming a nation can reconnect us as a people. This segues to Dr. Mary Khan's lecture about the need to have a collective effort in putting Southeast Asia in global history. His study of the 1,200 letters deposited in the King's Palace in the 19th century reflects the cosmology, worldview, and social and political life in the archipelago before the colonization. The letters uh, which historians, as we historians know, are primary sources, reflect the sentiment and the dynamics of European relations at that specific time. Dr. Akdian discussed how the arrival of BOC transformed Indonesia. He argues that Indonesia is a product of conflicts and long bloody war. BOC rose to glorious heights as it became a naval power, but eventually weakened its power when the political leaders started owning lands. The Sultan, Sultan Agum allied with the local chiefs gaining power in the monopoly of trade. So colonial power was no more was no more interested in spice trading, but shifted instead to uh, controlled bulky commodities such as sugar, coffee, um, and um, others. A national economic system emerged, and that is, that is an inter-island trade propelled by mercant mercantilistic economy. Dr. Jailani, talked about the role of physicians in the VOC vessel that carried doctors to take good care of the sailors or the colonizers on board. It is about the history of medical science in Indonesia. The war between Dutch and friends led to these doctors becoming prisoners during the expedition in the 18th century. These doctors uh, enriched their knowledge in studying natural history plant herbal medicines, meaning in the field of botany, despite uh, uh, being inside the uh, military uh, ship, military expedition. Their different, the, their difficult situation did, did not stop them for, from researching about the medicinal plants of Java that were very useful in treating the local people. Now the common thread or the common theme that the plenary speakers um, talked about calls for us historians and educators to decolonize our systems, our philosophies, our theories, and even our own languages. Southeast Asia must come out from the shadow of the empires and the colonizers. We, as the plenary lecturers say, must locate Southeast Asia in world history. The plenary presentations are one in saying that we need to have more researches and in-depth studies about Southeast Asian academic, political, social, cultural, and medical histories. And that's the synthesis for uh, today. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for listening. Back to you, Dr. Santiago. Can you, can you hear me? I'm sorry, my signal is a bit weak right now, but uh, I just want to tell everyone, thank you for joining us today. And tomorrow, the session will begin at 8 o'clock. So see you tomorrow.